Open up that crystal Pepsi and get comfortable. This is Dope Nostalgia. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the latest episode of Dope Nostalgia with your host, me, Naomi. My special guest this week is one of the stars and contestants on The X Factor from the UK. Sean Smith will be joining me to talk about all 90s stuff as well as this great new swing album he put out um, with covers from the 90s. A lot of them are from European acts and is so much fun to talk to. So you're going to get to meet Sean Smith in just a moment here. First, let me give you a little bit of information about him. Wikipedia Moments. Sean Smith is a solo artist from Portsmouth, England. He shot to fame in 2007 as one half of Same Difference, who were finalists in the fourth season of the UK reality TV show The X Factor. Same Difference went on to sign an album deal with Simon Cowell's label, Psycho. Their debut single, We Are One, shot into the top 20 and was followed by the album Pop, which has been certified gold in the UK. Following the hit TV show, Same Difference embarked on the X Factor Arena Tour in 2008, where they received enthusiastic critical reviews. In 2016, Sean signed to Energize Records as a solo artist to continue his love for creating music. His debut solo single, Turn Me On, was the fastest selling record on the label that year. In 2017 and 2018, Sean followed up with the singles Magic and Fire and released the duet Verona with Australian artist Peter Wilson. The song reached number one in the Argentinian iTunes chart. In 2019, Sean released Do or Die and did a duet with his label mate Ben Davidson entitled Dirty Mirrors. He also collaborated with Portsmouth band Beware the Bear on the single Show Me Love, which featured in the BBC Two drama Mother, Father, Son. They have since released a five-track EP entitled We Will Survive. His debut album, Solo, was released in July 2020. In the same year, he re- reunited with his sister one last time for the same different single One Life, One Love to raise money for the COVID-19 urgent appeal for a- NHS charities together. Since then, Sean has returned his hand to one of his favorite music styles, Swing. He combined it with his favorite era for music, with the album called Swing for the 90s. Sean also has a love for theater, and his credits include Evita and We Will Rock You. He has also leaded numerous pantomimes and touring shows all over the world. Please welcome Sean Smith to Dope Nostalgia. We get into the interview right at the beginning, talking about his experience visiting the east coast of Canada, just so you have a little bit of context about our conversation. And here it is. But um, <laughs> I think that the East Coast of Canada is where you were, which is probably the most yeah. like England because it has some older character buildings. You yeah. know, it was settled first, probably similar in weather and yeah. it makes sense. So maybe, maybe, but it, it, it felt good. It felt homely, that's for sure. So and they really know uh, how yeah, to party beautiful. out there. <laughs> <laughs> do they? Is that right? Do you know, it was such a flying visit. We didn't really get to do that, but I just used to love like, the food was good, you know, the port was lovely, the people were great. So for me, yeah, love it. And I'd like to do more exploring out there, to be fair. It's, uh, yeah, it's beautiful. I'm sure. sure you will. You'll be back here for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, hope, I hope so. So I know you've had some great successes um, in, in parts of the world that maybe you're still um, trying to get to North America more, right? Like, I think... Um, that this is like a good opportunity for you to tell everybody about some of the experiences you've had so far. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, f- I mean, I'm sure none of your listeners will have a clue I am, but uh, I did the X factor, which is, you know, it was at the time of doing it here in the UK, it was number one show on the TV. Yeah. And uh, I think, you know, considering we've got such a small country, I think there was, 22 million viewers in the final of which you know my sister and I managed to reach that uh, that that part of the show so it, aside from uh, the football which we're big into our football here in the UK as I'm sure the whole world knows aside yeah. from one of the games of the national team it was like the most watched show of the whole 
uh, whole year, which, you know, it's amazing. So, uh, and we ended up uh, placing third, got signed to Simon Cowell's record label. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of him in, in, yes, in Canada. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Actually, we've heard of the X Factor. Um, there was an American version of it for a short time. Yeah. Uh, so I think what we know mostly of the X Factor, I think, isn't that where One Direction came from? Yes, certainly. They were a few years after uh, my sister and I, but yeah. yeah, obviously they 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 managed to crack America, which is what I think every artist in all of the world are trying to do, <laughs> trying to get over. Um, but yeah, incredible experience. That's all I can say about that. Well, that's what I want to help. I want to help with getting you known out here, and so oh, that hopefully you. you can come tour here. And um, so you've been performing since a very young age with your sister as well. Um, yeah, I guess so. I mean, I've, I've always loved performing. It's, it's something that's sort of in my DNA. Um, I, I tried, my dad was a footballer. I tried to be a footballer in my early years, didn't quite work out and, uh, ended up sort of finding that I had a voice and, you know, all through school, it was something that always, you know, I was known for and just kept me going. And, uh, yeah, I, when I was seven years old, I was in the, uh, the touring production of, uh, Evita, which again, a huge show. Mm. And it kind of gave me that grounding in theater, which is something that I still love to this day. Nice. Um, yeah, I f- finally finished school at 16 and went and tried, tried numerous boy bands, <laughs> you know, yeah. and uh, ended up, uh, ended up on uh, cruise ships, which was really good in my my early years from like 17 to uh 20 around about that sort of age and then all of a sudden it just it just took off went for the uh fateful audition mm-hmm. um my sister and I got put together as a band and uh, it all kind of went from there but I mean to be honest with you uh, in answer to your question my sister and I didn't necessarily perform together an awful lot apart from like indoors to our family you know because we were just mm. we were both lovers of performance and music yeah and uh so we used to you know, performed together a little bit when we were kids, but we were actually going in our sort of separate directions. She was off to college in London, one of the big sort of theatre schools. And I decided to go a separate route, as I said, with boy bands and, mm-hmm. you know, trying to make it in the commercial route. And uh, yeah, we ended up just coming back together for, for the X Factor. And that kind of took us on a 10 years of touring together. We did Wembley Stadium, the Oto Arena oh here in the UK. It was incredible. Wow. Yeah. Amazing, amazing times. Um, and but as as you know, with with those kind of shows, it's it's kind of like a a conveyor belt. Before we knew it, you know, One Direction were along, and <laughs> we've been forgotten. <laughs> so it's just one of those things. It's a finicky business, you know. Um, but mm. what a great like experience for you to uh, get out there and known through that show. Who were some of your musical heroes growing up? Who influenced you? Do you know, I my biggest ones, I mean, I was born in 85 and I didn't really start understanding music till I was maybe, yeah, six, seven, that sort of age. But by then it was like a lot of the greatest hits from the 80s were coming back. So Bon Jovi was a huge <gasps> one. Um, Meatloaf. <laughs> God, you love Bon Jovi. Bon Jovi's my favorite band. So I love it. I yeah. love that. Do you know, it's um, just the other day I was putting the greatest hits back on. You just think how many bangers there are. And I know every single word because it's like ingrained in me because I played it nonstop until it was all scratched. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, Bon Jovi was huge meatloaf. Um, it's, it's, I'm trying to think. I love the nineties was definitely my era. Mm-hmm. Um, and all the influences came from there really. And, uh, you know, obviously the kind of sound of it has come from there, but the, obviously the production moves on and things keep moving forward. You've got to kind of get a mix so that it doesn't seem so old fashioned. It's like, unless that's your thing, you want to try and do that. But I, um, I mean, they, they were the two big ones really. I mean, you probably won't know over in, uh, over in Canada, my other favorite who kind of saw me through the nineties was, um, Robbie Williams, I oh, mean, I think he, he tried to hit America, right? And didn't quite, didn't well, quite hit the world light. I no. think he hit pretty good in Canada because we knew a lot Great. of his hit singles. Yeah. Amazing. So yeah. of course you've got like angels and uh, rock DJ, all that, yeah. all that kind of stuff was big. He was in a band called um, Take That that were big in the nineties. And again, I was kind of like, they were so loved by the girls. It was like uncool to like him as a guy. <laughs> but when he came out solo, he kind of come out with this new image and it, I definitely mm. followed everything that he was doing. So they were the major ones really, but I, I, I'm a lover of all things music mm-hmm. and particularly that era. 
And which is very interesting because this is a 90s centered podcast. So I yes. thought you'd have a lot to offer um, in, in the influences you've had. Um, and pretty much growing up around that same time, because that's when I discovered who my favorites were as well. Um, Go on, let's, let's hear some. <laughs> well, obviously Bon Jovi. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that was a huge one for me. Alanis um, Morissette's got to be in there, surely. Absolutely. <laughs> but we were Goes back- about saying. Did you ever hear about her pop career before she became big with Jagged Little Pill? No, no. She was she was big in Canada just doing like pop songs for two albums. Just, wow. And then and then all of a sudden she comes out with that You Oughta Know song and everybody in Canada goes, is that her? Like they couldn't believe it. <laughs> Amazing. So, yeah. So so what we know wasn't the her that you kind of grew up knowing I guess is that what you're trying to say yeah yeah it's weird isn't it because it's, it feels great with these artists to kind of know where they started mm-hmm. and uh, I often find that it's like my my dad grew up in the era of Queen and I went and did um, We Will Rock You which obviously is another big sort of Queen all the ch- songs of Queen are in it yeah. and uh, he said you know when they first started you know I saw them in this small venue and <laughs> and at the time you know everyone thought it was uncool to like them and it's it's just madness so mm-hmm. amazing stories but every musician has their their root I guess and he's very I'm fortunate. hoping that it'll happen to me yeah he's very fortunate that he got that experience to see them live like yeah. that Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's incredible hearing the stories. And he said he always championed them. And when they finally were taken really seriously and everyone loved them, he was like, I knew that. But <laughs> my dad <laughs> likes to say that about so many, like he, he played against every footballer that, mm-hmm. <laughs> that was, you know, world-class or whatever, and had a good game against him. <laughs> it's quite like, you don't know. Uh, you, you, well, obviously I'm, I'm taking it as truth, um, but he is yeah. funny like that. He likes to say about all the things that he did back in the day. It's really cool to hear the parents' stories when you're older. I love, yeah. I love hearing about what they, I actually, yeah, I just asked my mom recently about some of her music experiences because I wasn't ever really sure, but it's, it's nice to, to learn about that. One thing uh, we were talking about things that we don't know very much about in North America, of course, it, football in North America, we call it soccer. Yeah, of course. And we didn't know much. We honestly don't know a lot about it. It's not as popular here, but I remember David Beckham, when he came over, that kind of changed things a bit. You know, yeah. so they brought that popularity and that interest. Um, yeah. So well, the Spice Girls were huge for me as well during the 90s, by the way. And um, yeah. that's they're one of the artists that are on my latest album. I'm sure we'll get to that at some point. But um, they they really were the 90s in that time. And um, I mm-hmm. think the whole football thing here, well, soccer, obviously, is um, during that period it was huge as well because we held the the big european championships in our country at that time and so music and football and the culture just felt great obviously there was no covid so i was mingling and mixing and everyone can remember where they were on these certain times and it was just a beautiful beautiful era to be alive really honestly it was really fun, especially like I, I really enjoyed the early 90s and the late 90s. Um, were, were you a fan of, well, take that, obviously. Uh, what about the uh, Backstreet Boys and the NSYNC era? Oh, absolutely. And yeah. Britney. They were my boy band era. So, oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is it? Hashtag uh, save Britney or no. Yeah. Free Britney. Uh, free Britney. Yeah. Free Britney. Oh, I love that. I, I watched that on um <laughs> On Netflix, I think it was, and amazing again. And, and you're just reminded of what an incredible artist she is. And, you know, it made me go, hashtag free Britney. <laughs> you, you kind of become a conspiracy theorist and think that there's something going on, but amazing. But that era was, again, huge. NSYNC, um, uh, Backstreet Boys. I, I was going to go see them in Vegas. Unfortunately, I didn't get down to it in the end. I went because my friend offered me um, some free tickets to go and watch because he was in a rock show over there. Mm. And so we ended up going to that instead. But apparently it was an incredible, uh, even to this day, this, the harmonies are still as tight as they've ever been ever, back in the 90s. But yeah, that time fun. NSYNC was when uh, our boy band was getting created and we were kind of like pretending we were them. <laughs> <laughs> you can't become a copy of something if you're going to try and make it big. That's uh, that's the first rule that I learned at that time. It's very true. You have to be you all the way, right? So, 100%. What is one of your most memorable performances that, so far in your career? 
Oh, um, I, I think probably we arrived on the scene properly in the X Factor when we sang um, "Nothing's Going to Stop Us Now," the Starship mm. on the on the show, and because we were kind of known for these gimmicky things on the show, and we were one of the first artists to really do that because up to then it was more of like a singing show and then we came along and all of a sudden and uh brian friedman who was britney's uh choreographer he was one of the oh. he was the creative director of the show and he really took us under his wing and started using us as his kind of like creation creative mind creation and it was incredible and all of our performances were kind of known for being the fun performance of you know everything happening glitter blues you know you name it it was there we had even had turns of the stage to a circus in one performance but i remember because we were getting a lot of uh, stick for um our performances saying it's all about the gimmicks and stuff so this day we stripped it all back and just sang the classic song with, with all our heart we were both wearing black and uh, we managed to get through that week. And I think for me, that was that was the performance that I look back on and go, people then started to turn and go, well, these guys can really sing. These guys have got something and it, it kept going through. But there was a really emotional performance as well, right at the very end in the semi-final, because um, unfortunately my sister was uh, got bullied at school oh. and they decided to turn, you know what they do on these shows where it's like, <laughs> tried to make tried to make it emotional but it, yeah. it was a true story but obviously it was just heightened and uh but and we sang a song that meant an awful lot to her mm-hmm. and uh that that I still remember that to this day as one of the most special performances just because of the emotion that was added to it but of course going on tour was then a huge thing too and there's so many amazing experiences with mm-hmm. that so I mean there was three big ones there but they're mm-hmm. definitely the ones that stick and uh, you know to all your listeners to everyone viewing you can definitely check them out on youtube i'm sure we'll be on there somewhere and uh yeah leave a comment i guess What was it like working with Simon Cowell? Incredible. Um, he was our mentor on the show mm-hmm. and he um, he was relatively hands-on. He was a very, very clever guy. Mm-hmm. And he could, he didn't only see the song and what would suit you. He also saw the bigger picture and what it meant for you as artists and which direction you were going. So he was always very mindful of that. Mm-hmm. And um, he gave so many sort of pearls of wisdom. And he's one of those people that he's got such an aura and charisma that when he walks in a room, you hang on his every word and mm-hmm. you just really want to um, impress. I mean, I guess, you know, knowing that he could sign you up to the biggest label in the world at the time <laughs> was probably a reason why you wanted to do everything you could to impress. But I think we did. I think we impressed him from the word go. Um, the, one thing I will say on the flip side was we had a, a, an album deal with him at the beginning. And then, um, you know, we we ended up going gold here in the UK. I think we did a quarter of a million sales, which is really, really good for that time. And obviously there's a lot of physical copies selling at that time. 
Yeah. Um, the, the year before Leona had gone multi-platinum all over the world. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so, um, so it wasn't really enough for that label. And when we did finally get dropped, it was, it was his, uh, his sort of right hand lady that gave us the call instead of him, you know, and mm-hmm. we felt like we'd worked our, our socks off, um, to, to try and make sure we deliver for him. So that was a shame, but incredible guy and gave us all of our dreams and, to this day, it's, it's kept me in good stead. So I, I've got no bad word to say about him for sure. Wonderful. Wonderful. Now, like I said, there's things we don't know much about in North America. And one of those things would be the legendary Eurovision song contest, <laughs> which just ha- wrapped up about a month ago, right? I know. I know. Germany. Uh, no, but it wasn't is, Germany, was it? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. But this is a no. huge deal internationally. Yeah. Oh, you, you watch it, do you? I didn't learn about it until recently. Is, Is that, that because crazy? you watch Eurovision on, on Netflix with Will Ferrell? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might say that. <laughs> I'm joking. But I guess it oh, kind of made people finally realize there's this huge, huge event. It's called Eurovision. Yeah. Now, you sang a song. You recorded a song that was a Eurovision track, right? That's true, yeah, for, for Melody Festival. And but the thing is, it's so political. I don't know if you guys know this, but... Um, oh, tell like, me. For example, the UK will never win it. Uh, I mean, they, they did back in the day because we were kind of liked in Europe. But obviously with this whole Brexit thing, I think we've kind of been climate... <laughs> I don't know, I don't like getting political, but it, it, as far as the Eurovision Song Contest, we're not endearing ourselves to the rest of Europe, let's put it that way. And I think... Mm. Um, that's their chance to, 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 to let us know that, you know, we're not favourable. <laughs> and uh, we, we, we'd had a decent song. I mean, it certainly wasn't, you know, a winning song. It certainly wasn't top five. You couldn't say we were robbed. Mm. But um, it, we always know if you enter for the UK, you're going to, it's going to be a political thing. You, you're going to end up with naught points. And you're going to end up with egg on your face. And it's quite embarrassing. So we decided to flip on his head because we knew it was so political we knew we had no chance. Um, we, we ended up collaborating with a Swedish writer and uh, ended up going for, trying to enter uh, for Sweden. And, and they go through um, like an X Factor style show called Melody Festivalen um, oh, cool. to try and find their winner to, to go and represent them at the um, Eurovision Song Contest. And yeah, unfortunately didn't make the top six, which meant you on the show, but it was, uh, it got really far and, and the song ended up, getting released in the end and it was a real fan favorite so that was my experience with it but um I, look I mean it's one of those things that I would absolutely love to do in my lifetime I wonder whether that ship has sailed but at the same time you can never say never so mm-hmm. it's uh it would be a hell of a lot of fun that's for sure but even if we did get Neil Poir to say that you've been part of such a huge uh show and something that's loved all over Europe it, it would have been it would be something incredible for sure I had some trouble trying to find the Eurovision song that he actually wrote. Um, I ended up finding that song Verona that he performs with Peter Wilson, which was a song in the Eurovision contest. And I'm going to play a clip of that because it's a really cool, fun song. Podcasting is so much fun, but it's kind of expensive too. We got to pay for stuff like licensing fees, hosting fees, long distance phone calls, etc, etc. You get the drill? Okay. 
Well, we have a new thing called Patreon. Now, Dope Nostalgia has a Patreon account where you can subscribe to premium content. And what that means for you is for the very low starting price of $1 a month, you'll be able to get the podcast two days in advance of the regular release. Not only that, $3 a month, you get exclusive video content just for you guys to check out bonus stuff all the time that you don't get with the regular show. So check it out, patreon.com slash dope nostalgia. Become a subscriber today and get all the good perks. It's the new kids on the block. Joseph, Jonathan, Jordan, Donnie, and Danny. Who's their number one fan? I'm the number one fan. I've got all five concert kids with all five personal interview cassettes. I am. I've got all five concert kids with their cassettes and the new kids' stage. Plus all five kids in their street clothes. I'm the number one fan. I've got all the kids, their stage, and the new kids on the block phone. The new kids on the block. Who's their number one fan? I am. New kids on the block concert kids come with cassette, stage, hanging loose kids, and accessories sold separately. <laughs> And now that you're an established solo artist for over five years, you have just released a a jazz take on some classic 90s hits, which I'm really excited about, Swing for the 90s. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, so much fun to, to, firstly, the nostalgic feeling of reminiscing over all those incredible songs and those incredible days of my life. And that was the biggest fun part, I think, was creating all these playlists on Spotify and Mm. deciding which ones are going to make it and which ones are going to suit the swing style. I've always had this idea of doing it because as, as I said to you before, Robbie was a big, I was a big fan of his and he did a a swing album and he dropped it randomly and it was a huge hit over here. And um, he did an incredible show at the Royal Albert Hall and um, it's one that I used to kind of watch and rewind and play and watch his mannerisms, love the songs that he chose to do. It was, it was, and then off the back of that, you know, there was a big West End show of the Rat Pack that started to, because it was, it kind of brought it back to the surface and everyone realized how incredible it was. Mm. And I always had an idea of doing that. And um, when we were on the X Factor, we did Reach for the Stars by S Club 7, oh, which nice. I'm not sure <laughs> you, know, you, know, you did. Yeah, it was, uh, we, we did that, but in a, it was on Big Band Week. So they turned it into like a swing version. Again, it's probably on YouTube if anyone wants to check it out to know what we're talking about. But um, yeah, it, I, I thought on that date, wow, this really works and there's something in this. And I've always wanted to go back to it, but the timing was never right. And because I had a bit of time during lockdown, I figured, do you know what? You've always wanted to do this throw it out there, see what people think. And Mm. I had the most fun making it, that's for sure. So you did the primary recording during the lockdown time? Yeah, so that was another thing. Getting the right producer was paramount, Um, but it was kind of, I was getting the the tempo right and then just kind of singing it in. And then he kind of created a MIDI track and then um, he sort of almost put the parts together, but then sent it off to some incredible session musicians who Mm. would then send the parts. and. I would just here at home um, record the vocals indoors. And I really enjoyed singing all those songs that I used to love and putting my version of it. And, and so it all came together and it's, it's amazing. I think there's something to be said for musicians being together and the flow happening and for feeling it together. But also I think what an incredible world that we can have a pandemic like that, that causes such a crisis and yet we can still do what we love and still continue to create great music mm-hmm. just purely because of our love of it. And there's something to be said for, you know, the, we're going to make this happen no matter what. And I love that. And I think we came up with a great piece of art and I'm so, so proud of it. I'm excited to share. It. And I think it's amazing that people took this time locked down to be creative to put out music. I think the only downside was just the lack of being able to perform mm, for an audience. It's huge. Yeah. Do you, have, do you have some performances starting to come back up? How is the state? A few. Of- I've got one yeah. on the 31st of uh, July, which I, I just, I'm, I so, so need it. Um, the, I was doing, we were rock you. And then that unfortunately got canceled because of COVID. And then got, we came to, um, Christmas last year we, we we're big into pantomime here in the UK and I was doing one of those and that unfortunately got shut down as well because we went into oh. a third tier of which meant that our 
um, our area got shut down. So I've kind of had a bit of unluck with the live performance. And now it seems like, cause obviously I've got a lot of friends that are in, in the theatre world on my um, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And it seems like they're, they're all starting to get into different jobs. I've, I've got a job lined up. So unfortunately I'm not kind of look, looking at the moment, but hopefully by the time next year comes around, you know, everything will be opened up. We can be back to normal, but that, I think it's, it's hurt the music too, because like the numbers on, on this album um partly because we haven't been able to get out there and go and perform it live and that's when people really start to um internalize it and feel emotion because they've been there they've seen it and they want to remember those times Mm -hmm. um so it's that has been a big shame um but i mean i've been delighted with the reaction of everybody i think everyone thinks it's a, a great body of work they they love the choices so for me, it's it's been an all-round success. Uh, three number ones as well from from the out. I think four actually, and the album went in on the um, jazz chart as well on iTunes. So it's all round. We've been delighted with the success of it. That's wonderful. Oh, yeah. I'm so happy to hear that. <laughs> That's <laughs> doing so well. Um, one uh, one and one. There's another single you put out recently. Can you tell us about that one? Yes, with um, it was a Robert Miles classic. It was again huge, huge hit here. Beautiful piano in the original. But we, I, um, I've worked with a, an artist called uh, Peter Wilson. Incredible artist. He's, he's he lives out in Australia, and um, you know, global fan base. And um, he, we did a, a, a song called Verona, which was a, a take on a, a Eurovision song. Mm. and it was it went down really really well with the fans you know streamed really well it it got to number one in Argentina and he came to me and said um will you uh like to sing on my uh, on my latest album Electricity and at this point I was like well it's because we had such a good hit with that one it seems it seems a shame to kind of go over old old ground but I thought you know it worked so if we get the right song Mm-hmm. Let's do it. And he, we, we went around to lots of different records, landed on one and one thought it said an awful lot with the lyrics, of, you know, the fact they're on opposite sides of the world and we've got this pandemic going on. So we were emotionally involved in it. And I, I, I think the, uh, the record turned out really, really well. It's, it's, it's very sort of 80s style, um, wow. which it's, it's kind of like a, an erasure kind of song, but, but that's who he is. He's, he's, He's called P80s on um, on Instagram, but that's what he's all about. It's like his market, his niche, and he loves it. And and uh, and I, I'm always happy to let him run with it. And I'm glad with how that one turned out as well. Talk about the UK. Some uh, it's one of those places I definitely need to visit in my life, which I haven't yet. Um, what are some of the favorite things that, about your country and your culture that you would want to share with the world? Like a little known, maybe a little known fact. <laughs> oh my goodness, we are. You can take your time to think about it because I. Can't. <laughs> I think. It, um... I, I do think the, the fact that we're ingrained in such history. Um... That, that is something that I'm always very, very proud of. I think that, you know, the, the monarchy, it's been a lot of um, bad press, I, I guess, about our monarchy of, of late and with certain things. And, and um, but I, I kind of love that we're steeped in history and, mm-hmm. you know, we're, we're a small country, but we, we're quite um, forward thinking, like, uh, I don't know. I, I think 
there's a lot of because we're in Ireland there's a lot of beautiful seaside places to visit yeah. um, and London is is something that it's it has to be experienced because you know go, go see a show um, some of the best in the world um, yeah I, I, I just I'm, I'm proud of our little country I, I really am it's it's uh, <laughs> but uh, at the same time I guess we get a bad rep with a, in, in a lot of the world so that's why I think sometimes it uh, I feel even more proud but um, I guess every, like every country we're just trying to do our best and I think everyone wants the best for the for the entire world <laughs> I forgot what the question is now but you no, definitely need okay. to visit because you'll feel yeah. it and I think we're good people I really do believe that and I think also we, we've got a lot in common with Canadian people, I guess, at time. And, and I said this uh, off air I vi- when I visited, I just, I love the vibe of the people and it mm. feels, it felt very homeless. So I think you'd, you'd fit right in and you'd love it. And people would love you here as well. We, oh, we love okay. it when we get people visiting. Yeah. I'd love to come visit one day. Um, <laughs> where, where has your music career allowed you to travel so far in the world? Oh, Obviously you've been to, you've been, You've done the touring in Canada and you've obviously yeah. been to the US, right? Yeah. Well, the the ship that I was was working on um went out of uh New York, which is brilliant. We we recorded both our um recorded a lot of our album in Sweden, but we went out to LA mm-hmm. to do the photo shoot, the video. So I spent a lot of time out there, which I, again it's like a little world of its own in america it's completely different to a lot of the other places but yeah yeah, i mean really a lot of the place in america i visited um i did the med pretty much all all around the mediterranean you know spain egypt i i feel like uh you know i've seen an awful lot of places and i've loved broadening my horizons and traveling and all a lot of the caribbean as well as I've, oh, cool. it's beautiful out there um australia did a tour of australia sweden and denmark you name it um i've kind of been there and experienced it and and a, a big one i thought the, the, the one that shocked me the most i think was um i did a big tour of china and um yeah. <laughs> my goodness like it's like no other place in the world <laughs> like, i feel like you kind of know where you stand most basically and over there it's just a whole new world really and uh i found it intriguing to kind of understand the culture and uh the differences and stuff mm-hmm. but I, I i love broadening my mind like that and going and visiting all these different places isn't traveling amazing like yeah for sure it's, it's something that you've got to do whether you do it when when you're young and you know full of beans just want to see ev- everything you know <laughs> yeah or, or when you <laughs> or whether because i know that like you know, my family are thinking, you know, we're all set set now. And once the kids are all settled down and everything, we might go and do that because we haven't had the chance to do it because we've, you know, maybe got got married young and stuff and now they want to do it. I think it's something that's got to be done because there's so much beauty out there in this world. Is there a different sense of achievement when you when you want to break in America as opposed to anywhere else in the world? I guess it's like if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. And that's ah, and yeah. uh, <laughs> to good. quote to quote a, a swing artist from the uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. a very famous one like that. Um, I, I think that also here in the UK, there's there's something that's um, if you can make a success out there, there's like respect for you. But mm. then it's it's like I look at um, James Corden for example. We always saw him as like one of our own, and now he's yeah. gone out there. A lot of the people here in the UK have kind of gone off him. Like, oh, look at me, all big, big Charlie. Now. But that's kind of something that I don't like about um, the people here in the UK. Actually, is you know, it's like we'll champion someone to a certain level, but we, you know, we don't want them to fly. <laughs> it's like okay, um. you come back. That. And and, I, and and one thing that I love about um, North America is that there's this feeling of positivity and you know no you keep on flying we, we and we, we'll applaud that and it's it's a culture that I think is something that we should embrace a hell of a lot more I could see that in Canada I know when any of our actors or any of our musicians make it in the U.S. we totally applaud them and we we yeah we make it very well known that they're Canadian they're Canadian <laughs> yeah. we're so proud of you you know what I mean <laughs> Yeah, that's Brian how Adams, we are. I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Celine, ever you know, it's just. Oh yeah, yeah, cool. That is cool. how we are. Definitely. Yeah. Um, what's a concert that you experienced in the '90s that would have changed your life or really 
affected you? I'm sure you won't know these. Um, But there there was a a band called Deacon Blue. And uh, Deacon Blue. Yeah, a Scottish band. And they're very sort of like, they, they were championing the whole working class thing. And, and I think that's why I came to love them because my dad loved them. And cause he's, yeah, he's always been that way. He was a footballer, but it, it was something, he was really passionate about it. But um, I remember going to a concert and I was the youngest in there by a mile, but I knew all the records cause my dad had kind of pushed them on me. Yeah. And uh, I also, my granddad was there too. So we had the three generations in our family. He was the oldest by a mile, my granddad. I was the youngest by a mile. Most people were around about my dad's age. And I was, it was so packed that it was like, but everyone was really passionate about it. And I was on my dad's shoulders because it was kind of scary being, in, and plus I couldn't see anything. Mm-hmm. And by this point I'd absolutely fallen in love with music. And uh, Ricky Ross, who was the uh, lead singer, he kind of looked right at me he's in this thick Scottish accent went, you enjoy yourself, wee man. <laughs> and, and I was like, he's talking to me. <laughs> you know, it was, it was the most, that. oh, it was honestly, but you know, when like, it's a story I've always told ever since because it just meant so much, mm-hmm. you know? And, and I thought of all the people here, like the thousand people in this, he, he, he pointed me out and uh, yeah. And it was, it was so obvious that I was a huge fan because I was singing every word mm-hmm. right back at him with all, my, with all my passion because it was, yeah, but it's something I'll never forget. But had, I've been to, to some incredible um, performances over the years and, yeah, it's, it's it, awe-inspiring really when you think about it and it's what makes me love music. What a I can't moment wait that to come was, back. though. Hey? Yeah, I mean, how special. And yeah. uh, I'm sure he would not remember it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's cool. Beautiful. Yeah. It a lot to you. And um, now we obviously know that you're going to be doing some performances, like you mentioned. What else can we look forward to that you have coming up this year? Well, I'm, I'm not allowed to actually announce the job that's at the end of the year. <laughs> it's all good. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's something I've done quite a lot of, but I can't it, it, um, say it at the moment. But mm. I think what I'm really excited about is the potential of actually touring this album because I think it's 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 so right for a theatre tour. And I think I'm at that that kind of level, really. Um, I, I won't be doing arenas anytime soon again because obviously at that time we were on the biggest show. Even when we did, did the arenas, it was, you know, as part of the X Factor tour. Mm-hmm. So um, I kind of need to build myself up again if I'm going to get to that level but I think going out with a a really great jazz band and uh, just going out and singing all these 90s classics would be incredible and um, I'm definitely thinking about trying to get a tour together in the UK for that Mm -hmm. Um, yeah I've got got the show at the end of the year but I just think here we're still locked down after all this time and I think as soon as we're out of it it's things are going to open up and things are going to come back and and then we're going to get that that love for live music back and and that's something that I just can't wait for stronger than before because people now really appreciate what they were missing out on I think a hundred percent it's I'm I'm kind of worried on the 31st that I'm gonna sort of blow it all in one song <laughs> you know at the beginning because 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 I'm just so excited to get out there and I'm gonna give my entire heart um, because it's just, it's going to be an outpouring of, you know, the the fact that I've missed it for so long and I'm going to have to pace myself and make sure I get through the half an hour set. (laughs) And I will, I'll I'll thank my lucky stars and that, that I'm, that I'm up there again, because it's, it's been a long two years without performing. It's like, it's like air to performers Mm. and um, to not be able to do it is really, really difficult. It means a Amen. Lot, yeah. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> it's been so wonderful chatting with you and getting to know you and learn about your music. And I can't wait to share you with the rest of the world over here, you know? So thank you for your time today, Sean. Uh, God bless you. Thank you. And big love to all of Canada. And uh, I hope you embrace me. I hope you go check me out. But um, it's been an absolute pleasure. And I-, I hope to come over again at some point for sure. I wanted your love, but look what it's done to me. All my dreams have come to nothing. Who would have believed? 
All the laughter that we shared would be a memory. I cannot count the tears you've cost me if I could have seen. Do you ever think of me and how we used to be? Now I know you're somewhere else right now, loving someone else, no doubt. Well, I'm one for sorrow, ain't it too, too bad? Are you breaking someone else's heart? Cause you're taking my love where you are. Well, I'm one for sorrow. Ain't it too, too bad about us? Hey, kids, put down that Tamagotchi and listen for a second. You know, you can follow us on Twitter at Nostalgia Dope, Instagram at Dope underscore Nostalgia. Visit our website at www.dopenostalgia.com or pick up the phone and call us at 780-851-8785. This podcast is licensed by SoCan because we believe that artists should be paid for their work.